Great. Okay. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our last speaker for Genetic Genealogy Ireland 2020 Belfast. And um, before I do, I'd just like to thank our sponsors, Family Tree DNA, who have sponsored these uh, two days of DNA lectures and have done so since 2013 when we first started this uh, series of uh, conferences. And also I'd like to thank, thank all the, uh, my fellow ISOG volunteers, um, many of whom are manning the Family Tree DNA stand downstairs and who have provided such great free advice for a lot of people attending the conference. Um, Cahill McElgunn will be talking to us about Never Give Up, Miracles Do Happen, and this is a story about adoption. And the uh, Colum, him, Cahill himself is a molecular biologist. Uh, he was an um, uh, industri industrial principal scientist in London <coughs> with expertise in sample preparation, assay design, development, uh, amplification technologies, and bioinformatics. But in his spare time, he runs the McElgunn DNA Project and also the Fermanagh Monaghan Border DNA Project with Peter McWilliam. So here to and talk Sean. to us about, and Sean Core, uh, to talk to us about this wonderful adoption story and the fact that miracles do happen, please give a warm welcome to Cahill McElgunn. Thank you very much, Morris, for uh, inviting me to speak. And uh, thank you to all of you for coming today, despite um, the severe storm at Dennis outside. Uh, the title might be a little bit enigmatic in that it uses some Spanish, which I'll go into later. But the title was given to me by the adoptee in question. I, I told her I'm going to do a presentation about your story. What do you think the title would be? And this is what she gave me. So this is uh, this is what she wanted to have it herself. Um, it all happened in 2018 October when I was talking about the health applications of DNA in GGI 2018 in the RDS. And when I was returning from that, I flew from Dublin into London Stansted, and I was taking the train from London Stansted into uh, Tottenham Hill and then continuing on into West London to go to work. And I got a message on my, my Facebook which said, um, you show up on my family list on 23andMe. What city do you come from? I'm looking for more family. Do you have great grandparents who were called Samuel and Audrey? Uh, maybe they had a daughter named Susan who will now be about 70 with best wishes, Julia. So I took a great interest in this, and this is my Aunt Ethna. And because my father died in the 90s, I tested in as many of his siblings as I could, so I could take my own genealogy back further into time. Now, <coughs> Ethna was born in Fermanagh, like myself, and she spent her formative years in Belfast, uh, and then subsequently moved up to Donegal. Now, this is Julia. Now, Ethna and Julia, had a 11.2 centimorgan match on chromosome 15, which 23 and me was calling fifth cousins. Now, you may take a look at Julia and you may, fit, may think where she's uh, originating from. Some people in Cambridge say that she looks Eastern European, but that isn't the case at all. Uh, this was the 23 and me uh, relationship that was uh, posted between uh, Julia and Ethna. There was a little tiny little segment on chromosome 15, just one virtually clinging on by its nails to the cliff edge. So normally you would look at that and you think, well, I'm not going to do too much with that, but this is why miracles do happen. And this was the ethnicity result. Um, sorry. So in, in Britain, she was coming out as coming from sort of the northwest Lancashire direction, and, and also in the Midlands. Uh, the London is just because there's so much migration to London and people don't know where they originally come from, so you get, always tend to get a lot of hits in London. On the Irish side, uh, she gets a very strong hit in uh, Mayo, which is close, uh, but there's, there's, the Dublin is the same as London for Britain. You get a lot of people moving there forgetting where they came from and therefore claiming they're from Dublin when they're actually from Mayo. 
Um, my heritage gives this. Again, Irish, Scottish, and Welsh, 77.8%. And English, I should go back here and show down here. She was giving British and Irish of 90%. And these things here are just probably mixing into the English, or perhaps the Irish. Um, but Julia is from Spain, uh, hence the Spanish in the title. For the Spanish people that might ultimately see this, it will give them a better feel for what the talk is about, even though it's in English. So she was born in Spain, she grew up in Spain, and she considered herself to be Spanish. Until the time she did a 23andMe test, which came back as 90% 90 British and Irish, or effectively 100% British and Irish. So this is something of a conundrum. How did this happen? So Spain, I don't know how many of you know, but in the Franco era, uh, there was the issue of the nationalist administration taking babies of children from Republican families and unknown to the parents, forcibly adopting them into nationalist families. And over that, this is what it's called in Spanish, Niños Roboros por el Franquismo. Uh, and there were about 300,000 such children, which is rather a lot. And this lady here is one of the most prominent of these, who's been sort of leading the way to using DNA to identify. And she is in his madrigal. Uh, also, there was a, I was in contact with a Spanish journalist who was interested in Julia in case she was one of these uh, stolen babies in Spain. I mean, Julia was adopted in Spain, and the initial thinking was that she could be a stolen baby, but that didn't sit well with the British-Irish ethnicity call. I mean, you could think that there were some British and Irish in Spain during the Spanish Civil War, and maybe it's that way, but that seems rather unlikely. So we had to think, what happened? Uh, this is an advertisement from the InfoGenes uh, ES website with a couple of success stories with Innes having discovered by DNA that she was a stolen baby from this, this issue. And uh, of course there was Julia, but we have to go on to, to Julia more later. So the Spanish adoptee community use 23andMe and they also tend to use MyHeritage as well. So Julia had already uploaded to MyHeritage probably facilitated by the fact that they have, both companies have Spanish websites. So it's easy for them to use. Now, more information could be gained by uploading Julia's data uh, to other databases. So I initially helped her to upload to FTDNA, which was a little bit of a problem because she had a version 523 in me kit that needed to be converted using uh, DNA land imputation, which might not be available anymore, I haven't looked in a while, and a, a executable called uh, DNA Kit Studio. So I uploaded that to Family 3 DNA. I also uploaded her 23andMe data to GEDmatch. <coughs> now, the initial issue with this route was that she had no X chromosomal SNP data and everybody was her X match. So, but what you do is you interrogate all these databases and try and find high matches to try and figure out what had happened. So on 23andMe itself, these were her close similarities. There was one here at 1.55%, which is quite high, another one just over 1%, and the name Sweeney was coming out uh, within the family names of some of her close matches. My heritage gave this, again, another a uh, high match that didn't respond, and a couple of others. Uh, there were two adoptees on that list, and again, the name Sweeney is coming out. FTDNA, again, there's another two adoptees, and some of the high matches that are also present in my heritage. This was GEDmatch. Um, again, we see the adoptees, and we see the people coming in from the other databases, and we do have one higher match coming in from Ancestry that we would not have otherwise seen. So 
early on, I tried to speculate how Julia could be related to me. So one of the things I did was I searched on Family Tree DNA with all my ancestral names to see if anybody had a family tree that was matching Julia and matching my ancestral names. And there was a Fitzpatrick in Drumlane Parish, Belturbet County Carbon, just over the border from Fermanagh, where my fourth great grandmother was a Fitzpatrick from that area. And on top of that, there were ad additional intermarriages of Macogons to other Fitzpatricks. So it's quite an intermingled area. Um, there were no other names giving matches to this precise area. Uh, so we could speculate, therefore, that someone from Julia's line had married into the Fitzpatricks. This is my fourth great-grandfather's gravestone. He was Hugh McElgon. He died in Belturbet in 1846. Here is the inscription. And for the second time today, we have Requiescent in Passe. There you go. Uh, again, this was Bridget. Uh, she was born in 1782 and died in 1876. And we're thinking that a sibling of Bridget could be in Julia's line somewhere. No documentary evidence at all for this, because it's too far back. So the next thing we had to do was try to identify Julia's English tree using a hospital document that a historian called Celine Zicola had obtained from the hospital in Garona. Now, on this, we had locations, we had names. This is truncated. This is also truncated, but we knew the full names, and we knew that they lived in Coventry. So using this name information and these databases, managed to pull out a family tree, starting from a position of zero and ending up with a tree on the maternal side with hundreds of individuals going back to the 1700s by piggy piggybacking on other trees in ancestry, as you do. And of course, all of these were found by document databases, not by DNA. So the next challenge was to find her mother and the living mem members of her biological family. So this involved growing Julia's three forward to the present. So using databases to compile a tree of the marriage and children of Susan G, then using the electoral register and social media to establish their <coughs> whereabouts and contact details. A candidate for Julia's half-sister was identified in Cambridge, Cambridgeshire, after less than two days' effort. The question is, who to contact, how to contact, and how do you do this? This is a really difficult thing to do. But they really were sisters. <coughs> so this picture here sort of shows the terrain in Cambridgeshire. And if you notice my um, reed-like background, it's supposed to symbolize both Fermanagh and Cambridgeshire, just out of interest, if anybody was wondering. Um, so based on the forward-looking part of Julius III from the databases, uh, did a lot of work sleuthing, which is a, a word that Donna uses for uh, <laughs> uh, identifying people in the social media. Uh, so that, that was uh, the lady I just showed you, two days effort. And so we had Julia, Raphael, the Spanish journalist, uh, others and myself all searching, all sleuthing social media for a couple of weeks trying to figure out um, who Julia's mother and siblings could be. Now the complicating factor was that Julia's mother had moved away from Coventry down here and the clue was in Caroline's Facebook profile. She'd been born in Warwickshire but had grown up in Leicestershire. So all my focusing of efforts on Warwickshire was a complete waste of time. Should have been looking in Leicestershire. And that, that was the two-day step. So we were trying to locate Susan G in Leicestershire, which was far more successful. Um, I found Julia's mother's address on Find My Past in the, to the west of Leicester. Sent a message to Julia, just as much as I'd done with her, with her sister. You know, you paste in the photograph into a Facebook chat. She says, 
who's this? I say, this is your sister. Wow. Um, so this address was pasted into Facebook. What's this? Oh, well, that's your mother's address. Uh, so we have the address, we have the name, so how do we reach out? I mean, I did try to phone her mother's sister-in-law, and it was as if I was doing a cold call and I got nowhere. So that was my first attempt. I gave up with that. Uh, so this lawyer in Spain, who's very prominent in the adoptee community in Spain, had written the letter, ready to go off to her mother. But of course, you're scared about sending a letter, you know. It's, it's really, really a difficult thing to decide what to do. So what Julia did, you know, she had been observing all of Facebook. She'd been figuring out who her mother's children were. And she figured out that her half-brother's partner was called Charlotte. And she, she sent a message to Charlotte saying this is the story. Charlotte spoke to, to her partner, Mark, who then spoke to her mother. So we have the story confirmed. So now we have Susan and this is Susan here in joyful contact after more than 50 years. So these two have a lot of catching up to do. Uh, this for the Spanish folks is uh, Susan, the mother of Julia, as you, most of you would probably have guessed. So Black Friday came and I bought a total of four Family Three DNA kits for uh, Family Finder. I used three of them for my own cousins. And I used one of them to visit Leicester. I took the train to Leicester um, just before Christmas. Uh, this is Susan here. And as you can see, she's holding her Family Tree DNA envelope ready to go off to the post office. She and I walked to the post office and I posted it. So I explained to Susan how Julia and I had become connected. And I explained how we managed to find and, and how the whole process worked. I explained how Family Finder worked, and then we posted the kit to Houston. And in January, the result came back. Uh, mother, daughter, clear cut. So if you're wondering about the date here, that was because Family Tree DNA eventually caught up with version 5 of 23andMe, and I re-uploaded, and that was the date of that upload. So we're certain of the, we were already certain of the relationship, and now we have it absolutely confirmed by DNA. So this is the, the chap that runs the um, Spanish 23andMe user group for the adoptees. And he's announcing here that now Julia has found her mother. It's translated down here. And, and he's saying here, para mi, para mi un hero. That is me. I am apparently a hero. <laughs> Which made me feel quite good. <laughs> So the next thing to do was to find uh, Julia's per paternal side. So Susan stated that the name of Julia's biological father was a gentleman called E. Killeen. None of the DNA databases were giving a match to anybody called Killeen. Although Sweeney from Sligo was a prominent name among some of the high matches. So how to find Julia's paternal side. But at least we had names to work with. So, in February 2019, I found an E. Killeen with the correct demographic. He'd been born in Lancashire, and he was living in Warwickshire. Julia contacted his daughter, and I followed up. With multiple people of the same name existing, despite the type, correct time frame, this was not Julia's father. So it was a wild goose chase. <laughs> Uh, this is what wild goose chase is in Spanish, in case you were wondering. Uh, but at least these Killeen family had a family tree done for them, which they knew nothing about. So there's, somebody's gaining all round with this. Um, so then in early May 2019, I started to look for Killeen Sweeney couples in the public family trees. This was based on the hypothesis that Julia's parental grandfather was Killeen, and the grandmother could have been Sweeney, due to the number of matches that were citing that name. And I, this was the exact search function, pretty much. Found a tree matching this criteria on Ancestry, 
and the tree owner just happened to match DNA to match his shirt with Julia. Did the uh, social media sleuthing again and sent messages to Julia's half-brother, Sean, and his wife and daughter. Uh, the wife got back to me. Sean's DNA was on Ancestry. Julia's was on 23andMe. If one of them had taken the other test, they would have both found each other instantly. But, c'est la vie. His, as I said, his wife replied to my message straight away and connected with Julia straight away. And here's Julia announcing on the Spanish 23andMe user group that she found her father's family. And if you read this, she's thanking me. I'm almost her brother, uh, a great professional, many hours of time. And uh, she's talking about, where is it? Sleepless nights, uh, which is a clear case, as uh, Andrew Kane mentioned yesterday, of Gene Somnia. <laughs> So now she's in contact with her brother. Julia also had information on her father. This is him, El Padre de Julia. Um, unfortunately, he had passed away in the 1990s, just over a year after my own father passed away. So there's something in common as well. And this now, she has a family tree. She has her mother's family tree, and now she has her father's family tree. And now she has a family tree with 5,000 individuals on it, starting from a grand total of zero. So her half-brother's daughter uploaded her DNA to Jetmatch and FT DNA, which resulted in a 1,166 centimorgan match, therefore confirming the relationship. So with all of this, Julia was able to get her father's family history in Riverstown, County Sligo, from the 1800s to the present day. Then in September of 2019, <coughs> I was contacted by Muriel and David of the Cambridgeshire Family History Society, who told me there was an opportunity to speak on BBC Radio Cambridgeshire on this. And I had an interview by this guy, uh, jo uh, Chris Mann, on the radio in Cambridge back in September. Now the interesting thing about Chris and Man is that the man is descended from the Caithness clan gun. Now, there is a lot of confusion between Caithness clan gun and the Michael Guns of Fermanagh, which very frequently ends up anglicised to gun. And there are people in the United States who think they are one when they're the other, and vice versa. And that was just an interesting uh, thing that happened as a result of that interview. So, I was watching Facebook in September 2019, and I see all of a sudden that Julia's mother is flying to Zaragoza in Spain, where Julia is. And so the mother and daughter are reuniting for the first time since birth. Uh, Susan, then in October, the following month, the pair of them fly together back into Stansted, and they're probably driving about 10 miles away from where I am. But if you're relying on, on, on children that have busy work schedules and they have to go from A to B directly, they can't be making detours up into North Cambridgeshire. So this is Susan and Julia together. And Julia got to meet a whole pile of family in Leicestershire. And as you can see, they're actually quite similar. It's quite striking. So. When she met her brother, and this is him, and you can see the similarity there too, she found out that she had eight brothers that she knew absolutely nothing about. And this was the brother which she, who she met in Sussex. So she got to also, travelling about Britain, she got to see quite a bit of her ancestral country. So here we have the family similarities, Julia's brother and father and mother and daughter. And I think you can all agree there's a quite a lot of similarity between them. And I have been rather quick, but in terms of acknowledgements, I'd like to thank Celine Zicola Mutas for providing the documentation that gave us the names to 
to find the English side. Enrique Villa Torres for writing the letter that didn't get sent. Uh, Rafael Stepania for discussions and Miguel for discussions and the families and the close matches. And last, I'd like to thank Julia for letting me join her on her fantastic voyage of finding her biological family. And just last month, my v V523 and me came back, and lo and behold, there was a tiny match between me and Julia as well. So just goes to show from the very tiniest <coughs> of matches, families can very occasionally be found. And the conclusion is never give up because miracles do in fact happen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. How, how did Julia get to Spain? And how, what's, what's that part of the story? Can you reveal anything? Well, I, I asked each member of the family for permission to use their photographs. And I promised them I wouldn't go into any of the personnel, personal stuff, mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. to, for their, you know, for their privacy. Sure, sure, sure. No, that's fine. That's but fine. I do know. You do know. <laughs> fine. Okay. Um, a question is for a couple. Uh, comments as well. Uh, how many people actually in the audience have found an adoptee among their DNA matches? So there's quite a few people. Quite a few people. Um, and how, how many of you have ended up helping that adoptee find their biological families? So quite a few people as well. Yeah. And I think that's, that is something that is going to be more of the feature as time goes on, um, that more and more of us will find out we actually do have an adoptee somewhere in the family. I know I've got two in mind, one from 1920 when Great Aunt Mary went to Alaska to go fishing and she caught more than she expected. Um, and another one from the 1940s, uh, who is probably still around, and did turn up at one of my great aunt's uh, doorstep and said, I'm related to you, I think I'm your first cousin, and uh, I'm the daughter of Lucy so-and-so. And the great aunt said, no, Robert, she'd never had any children, she was never married, I'm going to give her a call right now. She phoned Lucy and said, you never had any children, did you? No, great, okay, fine, go away now. And so that poor old adoptee was turned away at the door. So different times, different uh, attitudes as well. Um, any questions, comments? Yes, Debbie? Did any of the other family know about Julia beforehand? Or is that something you're not allowed to say? Um, Julia was secret. They did know. The, si the siblings didn't know, but the parents did parents did know. Her brother didn't know, but wasn't surprised. <laughs> Let's move swiftly on. <laughs> um, so this was, was this the first time you actually helped an adoptee? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And have you been bitten by the bug? Oh, oh absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. I mean, it become you know, it's par for the course now if you're doing genetic genealogy. Mm -hmm. I think one of the one of the issues you raised is very, very pertinent. It's very, very difficult to know what's the best way mm. of getting in touch with the immediate family mm. um, once you actually can identify the most likely target. Mm. Um, and there was a lot of discussion going around. There never really is a right answer. Um, but you finally settled on Julia getting in touch with her half-brother's partner. Yes. Who then got in touch with her half-brother. I mean, the concern was, you know, if you write, if a solicitor write, writes a letter to the mother and the husband knows nothing about it and intercepts it, what can happen? So there was a great reluctance to post that letter. Yeah, yeah. Well, even anybody else had that kind of experience, uh, Jared? This comment, I was wondering, was the Spanish government supportive of helping to uh, solve these issues of the 200,000 uh, children? Um, 
But I didn't particularly consider this issue because it wasn't relevant in Julia's case. We might perhaps consult the press to see what the answer to that question is. So, I don't... You know, several Irish brigades went to Spain. Mm, that's at right. Time. I so know. we could have similar situations. <coughs> but in, in this particular case, it was not due to um, an Irish brigade in Spain at all. It was much more recent than that. Mm -hmm. And uh, Eileen, you had a comment to make? I have, I have a question. Sure. Um, I'm often contacted by matches who are adopted, and I don't really often know where we're connected. And besides t uh, advising them to get on GEDmatch, um, is there anything else I should be telling them? Get onto every database they can. Every single one. And the key thing for me was looking for common surnames among the matches, of which in this case, Sweeney was glaring out from the matches. Okay. Because then you know, if you have two, then you can start plugging them into three searches or marriage searches or like that. Thank you. Question here. Hi, um, it is not actually a question, it's a <coughs> comment, if that's okay. Uh, my name is Donna Shields. I'm a social worker within the field of post-adoption. Um, I work for Belfast Trust. Um, I guess you might anticipate that um, I would have some anxieties around the ethics involved, and some of it's not seeking to establish a police state, but I do think in there's a need to be very cautious. Have worked for over twenty years. Uh, with uh, birth mothers, with adopted children. I think I can speak from some experience and also having conducted some research in the field as well. So I would love to see some means of taking this forward. I think it's really exciting. I think it's, it offers wonderful opportunities. But I think from an ethical perspective, um, I think we should be looking at some form of collaboration with people within the field with experience in the area of post-adoption. So it's not seeking to shut anything down, we're working with adults, but I do think I've seen the first hand sometimes um, just the damage that can be done, the collateral damage from all of this. And it's just so that I would just like to urge some caution in it all, but to say that certainly it's really exciting and, uh, you know, I just hope we can collaborate rather than see it go ahead in a, a fashion that creates, you know, untold upset. Okay? I think that's a very pertinent uh, comment and it's something that I think anybody who's been involved in this work um, uh, will feel the same way because, you know, certainly I work a lot with adoptees, I get referrals from Bernardo's and from Tusla. Um, and it is wonderful to have them still on the case because they have the experience of working with adoptees and they know the horror stories and how things can go wrong. And of course, when you're a genealogist working with your matches, and it's exciting to find a match, and of course, that excitement gets communicated to the adoptee as well. And uh, certainly, I found it very, very useful when there are long delays in um, activity in the adoptee research, because it gives them a chance to stop bouncing off the walls. Um, and that you really do find that sometimes I'm running around the room trying to catch them because their excitement is just getting away with them. But the nature of the search is probably similar to the documentary research, is that there's a huge amount of activity and then nothing for months and months and months and then a new finding that a huge amount of activity and great excitement and then nothing for months and months and months. Oh, emotional roller coaster completely. Um, so it is all very, very difficult and I think it's wonderful to have a social worker in the background who can temper the situation and um, advise on what the, the best way forward is. But of course a lot of the people uh, a lot of the adoptees that we find in our matches, they maybe haven't contacted a social worker. And certainly I know in, in the South, uh, waiting lists for social workers is two years. And that encourages people to 
take the more direct DNA route rather than going down the traditional route. Um, and how we reduce the weight of this is, of course, uh, very, very difficult. Um, but I'm sure a lot of my colleagues here will have stories of how things went wrong, or they see the adoptee doing something, and it's like, you really shouldn't do that because you don't, you're not putting yourself in the shoes of the birth parents or the biological family. So it's very, very, it's a very difficult situation, and that's why when, you know, you were agonizing about, okay, we, we know who the family is, how do we get in touch with this family who we've never met, who don't know us from Adam, and tell them we have found your family secret? Well, in, in this case, Julia had a lot of support from the Spanish Adoption Network. I don't know what, quite what they call themselves in Spanish. She had the support of a, of a lawyer. She had the support of many people. She had support of, you know, all those many people that are with the stolen babies. And in the end, she decided herself what she, how she wanted to contact. And she would ask me, I would ask if she wanted me to do it, she'd give me permission to do it. Mm -hmm. But it was in her, ball was in her court. And that's fine up to a point. But I find myself, because I have to kind of make a judgment call mm. on how realistic is the uh, plan of action from the adoptee's point of view. And sometimes, you know, I will encourage them to use your own words, and you, you draft them, then I look over it mm. and give you some advice. And I do find myself making some major suggestions. Mm. I think even at that stage, there's issues in terms of the emotional journey for the person involved. Because if you ask someone to commit a lot of themselves to paper ahead of an approach, and there's what is then perceived as a second rejection, that the impact from an emotional perspective, you know, is mammoth. So, it, you know, there's it, it's a complex area of work, and it absolutely. It's very exciting, um, but I do, and I also take your point that um, in, in the heat of the moment, people can make approaches. They think they're being terribly diplomatic when they say they're doing family research or whatever. And you know what? If they knock on doors, and I can relate from personal experience just how that plays out because people aren't stupid, they've long memories, and you know what? The slightest suspicion does trigger stuff sometimes, and the impact emotionally can be quite devastating. So, and that's not to want to shut it down because there's nothing more pleasant, more enjoyable when it works out. It's a lovely thing to be, you know, it really is a privilege to be involved in that. But I do say you've got to be very mindful, it is an emotional minefield. And how do you see, when you talked about collaboration? So how would you see that evolving, or how would you like to see it evolving in the future? Um, so for example, what, what, what organization do you work for in Belfast? Belfast Trust. Yeah. Belfast Trust. And do you have any genetic genealogists on staff? <laughs> <laughs> no, we have a, have a researcher who's um, Kathleen would work in conjunction with herself. So Kathleen would undertake research for the social workers here in the north, all of our trusts and the volunteers. Which is, um, well, we've tempted it. That's becoming more and more part of it. This is really why I'm here today. And, you know. and, and have you done your own DNA test? I have, yes. Yeah. 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 And have you done much work with DNA, like what Coppola has done, finding well, sleuthing? Yes, it comes to sleuthing, yes, it comes to sleuthing, yes, yeah. yes, um, not necessarily a fan, but someone else was involved with the organization I work with, which is a great team. Well, not really, but, you know, yes. she's sort of interested in her own background as well. Sure. Yeah. Yes, it's, um, it's, it's, it's an evolving area, it's an evolving area, and I think we do have to be careful, because there are times when the whole thing goes wrong. Mm. And I'm sure we've got lots of examples of that. Debbie, you put up your hand. Um, yes, 
Yes, well, I was just going to say that um, I think it, maybe England and Wales, just England, but there is a system with an adoption contact register so that anyone who's adopted, um, they can register on this and the mother can register and they can decide whether or not they want contact and they can change that at any time. Um, but I presume there's no such system for in Spain or, um, I, I don't know what the situation is in, in Ireland as well, perhaps. Uh, um, but, but also with the, the donor conceived community, I've done some work, there's this, like a sort of similar situation there and people can actually, they, they can get um, a counselling session um, with um, a qualified person um, when they want to actually um, access the information about their birth parent. Um, so it seems to me that there needs to be some sort of, um, sort of intermediary system so that people can decide whether or not they want contact and that they get that professional support at the time when they want the contact. It, 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 I think it's just a recipe for disaster. If, if, in that case, it's worked out well. But when you have all these well-meaning genealogists wanting to get involved and all getting carried away, there's things can can and, and do go wrong without that professional support. Have you heard of any horror stories? Um, I won't. No. No. Um, Michelle, did you want to say something? Uh, just that there are separate adoption contact registers um, for England, Wales, Scotland, um, uh, the Republic, and Northern Ireland. They all have adoption contact registers. So if anyone has been adopted within any of those countries, that should always be a first port of call. Um, and if you find that a birth uh, parent or a uh, family member has uh, registered with them, then you, you will get some information from that and, and you will find out straight away whether they wish to have any contact before you try to make some sort of an approach. Um, of course, things get a lot more difficult when there is no information and those people haven't registered, as many people have not. And there are also, I always say this when talking about this subject, uh, the many, 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 you know, hundreds of thousands of cases where uh, someone has not been adopted but does not know who their parents, generally their father, is. And that support that exists for adoptees doesn't exist for those people. So it is a complete minefield at times, as uh, several people have said, and how to make contact is, is a very, very important subject. And in general, I would always recommend that you try to make contact with the birth parent directly, as opposed to a child or uh, a relation, uh, another relation in the family, because you simply don't know the situation and that birth parent may have spent decades hiding this secret and they may be absolutely desperate about that fact and then somebody comes along and tells their son or their or some or their cousin or somebody oh she had a baby you know and that that is an exceptionally emotional thing and i think if that birth parent is alive then all effort must be made for that the birth parent to be the first contact so that they have that chance to make those decisions about contact with their child and if they do want to do that about how they tell their family uh, about this child um, so that that would be the, the the number one thing that i would want to say about contact um, Matt, you do quite a lot of research with adoptees where do you get most of your referrals from are they referred from a, an adoption agency or is it just um, they come to you as members of the public? In general, they come to me as members of the public. And I would love it if that was referrals from adoption agencies instead. I would prefer that. But so many simply don't go that route. And I always encourage them to contact adoption authorities, to check adoption registers, to get their original paperwork, to seek out social workers, to seek out <coughs> counselling to make sure that they're in the right place to be taking on this work. I always say, I'm a DNA detective. I'm a professional genealogist. I don't say I am a counselor. I don't say I am a social worker. I am not. And therefore, this needs to be a collaborative process. And there needs, there are different people with different skill sets and different experience and expertise 
and it shouldn't all just be down to one person. Now, those of us that work on cases like this know that it is a very emotional thing to do and that we get very, very involved in the process for the adoptee or the person with an MP or the person with an unknown parent, grandparent. We get very involved in, in, in trying to get that answer for them, but at the end of the day, we have to try to remain as objective as we can to try and think about the other side of the equation and there are all sorts of things that can be happening on that other side of the equation and I have many amazing stories like Carl has just told of fantastic reunions and people who uh, were so happy to find each other and I have you know middling ones where people were a little bit cautious and things petered out after a while and then the contact didn't really keep up and all the way down to horrendous rejections and you can just get everything on this spectrum when you work on cases like this and I'm in complete agreement about how delicate it is and how much we have how carefully we have to proceed and how carefully we have to think and uh, lots and lots of, I do lots of uh, social media sleuthing, uh, but it's, it's important to, to be very, very sure before you start hitting send buttons uh, on messages to anyone. I was just going to add, I don't think some of the problem exists in this room because most of the genetic genealogists in this room, we've run privacy, uh, panels, ethnic, um, um, ethics type panels where we try to teach people about the ethics of what we're doing and why we're doing it and how to deal with it. Uh, for me the issue is the rogue genealogists that don't come to these conferences, that aren't part of the group, that are all working together to try and make this better, to try and get the right support for adoptees and people we're working with. And, and, and that for me is a problem. And I think we have to try and stop those rogue genealogists. I don't have an answer. But I just wanted to throw in that I think there's, there's that the issue for me, the danger for me is not necessarily the people in this room, it's the people that think they know how they're doing this. Identifying wrong parents for me is the worst thing ever. Um, breaking up a family even maybe if, uh, for identifying wrong people. I don't, I don't have an answer as I said, I just wanted to throw that in. Good. I think one other issue of course is that a lot of the time after the reunion you've got a honeymoon period but two years down the line it may be that they just send each other Christmas cards and the type of contact is quite minimal. So it's very interesting when you compare the excitement of the chase, so to speak, with the aftermath, which is, okay, I know now and I don't really know these people. In fact, we had um, my ex-flatmate, Dolores Quinlan, um, talking about her adoption experience in Dublin last year. And she'd done a little, she's a psychotherapist who discovered she was an illegal adoptee at the age of 48 years old. And um, uh, it's a wonderful presentation that she gave and it's available now on Family Tree webinars. But um, she did a little survey then of six people who had used DNA to find their family. And one of them made a very, very interesting comment. It was like, okay, I found my family, but now I feel I don't belong to two families. I don't belong to the family that adopted me, and I don't belong to the family that is my biological family, because I just don't have anything in common with these people. So the aftermath of the reunion, I think, is also a very uh, important time where we need to do more research on it, and we also need to have that ongoing support for adoptees past the reunion period into the aftermath period as well. Now, Candy, you wanted to make a comment. On, on Facebook, uh, there is a, a group that they are helping adoptees and all, you know, try to find their parents. But they they have special people that um, look everything up for them. But they still still give the adoptee the choice of how they're going to, and they ask for advice <coughs> all the time. And there are some horror stories on there that, you know, people are just, you know, crying. And uh, and then other things, they, they call them their search angels. And they are uh, just so happy and everybody's so... A lot of uh, men 
who had fathered a child and didn't know it. They never got married. They never had children. And all of a sudden now they do have. And they're thrilled. And then other times they were uh, uh, sperm donors. And uh, they could have several children. And anyway, it just gets so complicated. I like to read them except for the sad ones. But uh, it's out there, and uh, people try to warn against you know, moving too fast and saying the wrong thing and sending letters and having phone calls because I can't even imagine. Well, it's very true because DNA Detectives has over 100,000 people in that Facebook group, and that the Search Squad is another one of these Facebook groups. Um, so, like you say, it is out there, and it's happening all the time. But as with a lot of new technologies, they run ahead of us, and we're left trying to chase after them to catch up. So I was just going to make one quick comment, because I think, um, although DNA Detectives is doing a brilliant job with, in America, um, where they've got a big problem with closed, um, sealed adoption records, I think people are coming into genetic, to genetic genealogy seeing groups like that and then bypassing the usual systems, certainly in the, in the UK, where they can actually get the paper records, but they're being encouraged to, to go the DNA route before using the, the DNA records. Um, and because of the you know, sheer volume of American testers and all the, 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 the adoptee reunion stories that people are reading about, that's the way think that they should be going and they don't realise that there is sometimes support available elsewhere and they can find out without having to do the DNA route at all. Very true, very true. And of course we have these wonderful long lost family stories on television where every reunion is a happy one and that's not necessarily the, the case. Um, there's a, an Irish programme, TV3 Adoption Stories, where they actually covered a much broader spectrum of uh, results and outcomes, including the lady who came over from New Jersey, contacted the social worker, social worker wrote to the birth mother, and the birth mother wrote back saying, I don't want anything to do with her, and she had to go back to New Jersey, and that was the end of that. So here's a situation where the birth parents are known, <coughs> but because the birth mother doesn't want anything to do with her, she has to um, just forget about it, really. Um, we have two questions. We've got Patty down here, and I'm going to, yes, two people up here as well. Jonathan? Um, seeing over your first talking about um, the, uh, about the Park Rules regime, um, was um, legally um, adopting, doing it legally that way. I thought the very start that um, it was actually, like in America, like, um, the nuns would have sent, um, sorry, sorry, American families would have come over to the, like, the, like, the big nun race and stuff and would have um, sold kids to them, the American families. I was wanting to know, is, is that, does that happen in Spain? And if it did, well, would there be more cases, I guess, here coming online and like STEM organisations contacting us, um, help them, trying to help them defend their and families over here. So, so yeah, no, I think yeah, I think what the the case of the Franco children um, is it similar to what we've had in Ireland, where apparently a lot of the children from the uh, mother and baby homes were sold to American couples, for example. What actually happened with these three hundred thousand children that were abducted, um, and why why were they abducted? And what, what happened to them afterwards? What was the whole process? What? I am not a, an expert in this by any means, but how it started was if a, a woman from a Republican family, and I mean a Republican <coughs> in the Spanish Civil War sense, um, was in prison and de delivered a baby, then that baby, was, the mother was told the baby was dead, and the baby was adopted to a nationalist family, again in the Spanish Civil War context, yeah. um, such that the population was shifting towards the Republican side. Mm -hmm. That was their intention, and it continued. The non -Republican side. For the national side. Correct. Yes. Correct. Yes. For the fascists. <laughs> yes, that's right. And have they? How many of these children have they identified? Do you think? I haven't 
read the literature on this because I was particularly focused on Julia's story and this mm -hmm. was just a, a background to Julia's story yeah. rather than a particular focus for me. Sure. Okay. We have a question back here. My name is Santos. I am from India. Mm -hmm. I like to talk with you after the meeting. I need your help. <laughs> okay. There you have another client. <laughs> and we had a question or a comment here. And um, Paddy, yes, you wanted to ask something or make a comment. I've been involved in maybe 10 or 20 adoption cases. And the two that come to mind where the situation has been most difficult afterwards are the two where the birth parents subsequently married each other and kept the fact that they had a child before marriage secret from the other children. And they found it far more difficult to break the news that somebody who had a child is a single mother with a different father or whatever. In one case, I met the adoptee and her full sister, who had met each other and came to Ireland together, but couldn't tell the birth mother that they were going off on holidays together, and looked like twins, and got on like house and fire, but they were keeping secrets from the birth mother. In the other case, I got a phone call purporting to be from a friend of the birth mother, saying, keep out of this story, or we'll take legal proceedings against you, but please can I have the phone number of the girl in Australia? <laughs> so, is it always more difficult when the couple subsequently marry and then have to come out and confess their secret, or have I just got a small sample with two very similar results? And this is where we need a lot more, um, a lot more research to be done on this type of thing. Um, and there just isn't that kind of uh, quantitative research that has been done. I but is there? I is think it's quite interesting with the atomic people, but I think that is a mid point that you make, Paddy. Um, as I said, I've worked in post adoption over 20 years now, and would have worked in numerous cases where the parents went on to marry. And I think that does throw up additional. I think. Um, people would initially think, oh, that's all right then, that makes it okay. And I would concur with you, my experience would be that makes it much more difficult. Um, comment over here. I have a family member who had her daughter adopted when she was 16, 17. And the adoptee contacted her a few years ago, having been married, working as a social worker in line of work and got in contact and was very warmly received because she was wanting to be in contact with her for a long time. They lived very closely together beside each other practically. And um, but there was a cooling off period from the adoptee, not from the mother, who was devastated when this happened and is still devastated that there's this cooling off period and still is, and has two grandchildren, and is really, really distraught but doesn't get to see them. Now, she's subsequently moved further away, but, you know, um, but the thought that she missed out in all those years with the grandchildren as well as the daughter, but her mother is still alive, her, her, her adoptive mother is still alive, and they, apparently she feels that it's not really a good idea to be in close contact. But I mean, after all of that, Hard work getting in contact then to them and, and disrupting lives and then to, to sort of have this coming up very hard. Very hard. I'm actually engaged in research in terms of longitudinal outcome at the minute, and I think you're quite right in terms of expectations, even where, and I'm sorry we're getting off point slightly, but I think. Um, sometimes what happens is that, you know, the motivations are very different and I think in some instances, and you can't generalise, but I think certainly in terms of reunion for some adopted adults, um, it's around the curiosity, it's about medical information, it's about knowing their history, but if there are differences in terms of, and we don't like to talk about social class, but demographics, however we like to style it, that, you know, in terms of 
what sustains a relationship. And it's a much more emotive um, situation, I think, some of the time for the birth mother, because she's carried the baby, she's had that experience, and when they reunite, I think sometimes the expectations are more so of a reconnection, you know, close in the circle, whereas for the adopted person, it's much more in the vein of, um, yes, they want questions answered, they want to know who they are, but in terms of their expectations of their relationship, I think they're looking more, um, you know, uh, well, there's different research shows different things, but really an extended family relationship at best, or a friendship, as opposed to a mother-daughter, mother-son relationship. I don't think that's, I think most adopted people will tell you categorically, their mum is their adopted mum, that's the person that brought them up. They're not looking in with their mother. There is, there is, yeah. Um, we are supposed to be having an expert panel meeting now, but I think the discussion is so interesting that we're just gonna continue the discussion um, because I think a lot of these similar same questions would come up in, in the expert panel. Um, now, somebody else, Dar Daryl, you had a comment to make as well. I have a comment to make because I do some of these adoption reunions, and I think it's the expectations from both sides. And I think for the adoptee, they have to be told first of all, going in that, you're not going to go in and be this child, this mother's child. And for the mother, I think you have to tell them, this child's already had a mother. And what you're going to have to do is to be open-minded enough in whatever relationship that you have, you have to be appreciative of that. It's extremely difficult as a search angel to go and do this work and find out that the parents have been married since six months after the child was given up and there's full brothers and sisters out there. But the parents don't want the brothers and sisters to know that there's another child floating around. I have a very difficult time with it. I've cried many a night over an adoptee. I've cried many a night over a mother looking for a child. But I think if we have, it's our responsibility. If we're going to stick our toes in that water, we have the responsibility to tell both sides of it. You have to be open-minded. You cannot go into it looking for my mother. My mother loves me and is going to be hallelujah. She may not be. She may just want to be your friend. <coughs> and you have to tell the adopt or the mother this child may not want to have anything to do with you. She or he just wants to know where they come from. They already have parents. And that's extremely, extremely difficult. We, we have to remember, we're human beings. We're not just a fam, a mother. We're not just a daddy. We're not just an adoptee. We're human beings. And we have to look at those cases as a human being, case by case. And I think the, the, uh, it's interesting you mentioned the, adopt, the birth mother, because certainly um, down south, um, I have been referred to birth mothers who uh, are close to 80, and um, both of them had to give up a child for adoption 60 years ago. In both cases, they were never told the gender of the child, so they never knew if they gave birth to a boy or a girl. One of them, uh, after 12 months in the database, her son suddenly appeared up. So they were reunited. And it's terrible when you have a 75 or an 80 year old or a 90 year old woman who thinks that her child died and all of a sudden, 70, 65 years later, they get a phone call and say, hello, I'm alive. Uh, in this particular case, she knew that the, ch the child was alive and had been adopted. Um, but it's just to make the point that it's not just the adoptees that are looking for their biological parents, it's frequently the biological parents that are looking for the adoptees as well. Other comments and questions? Uh, Johnny Pearl and then Claire. 
and bring the mic down. Just a, a really quick one. It's funny for me uh, hearing this discussion because I have I've done kind of maybe three cases in the last year, and I realised this is why this was why it was relatively easy for me, and that's because. In all three of those cases, uh, there, there was no living parent, so mm. it becomes a much drier, uh, completely different experience. And of course, it's still you still have to be really sensitive. You still have to make these decisions: who do you contact, and how do you, how do you contact them? But in one case, yeah, I mean, the, the lady's 80 years old. Uh, she's just keen to find out: is there a history of heart disease? Where's this coming from? Uh, am I really? Um, and obviously, when you start a case, you don't know whether the parents could be alive or not. So. Everything still applies. Uh, it's, it's just funny that, for me, obviously, I, I, I know about all this stuff. To be honest, I'm mute to the DNA detectives group because I can't deal with the onslaught of emotion every day, either happy or sad. Uh, I'd like to have it there so I can go and, and look for discussions, but I can't actually deal with it on an everyday basis. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's a really, really good, good discussion to have so that we think about this stuff. Because when you go into a case, I, I always go in head first, oh, you know, I want to help people who match with my family because I feel like I've got the apparatus to do it, and obviously it's, it's very rewarding, but yeah, I, I know it's, it's, it's tough, so yeah, thanks everyone. Um, and we had a uh, comment from Claire as well. Actually, mine is a question. You're, oh, you've got a question. Uh, and it's, it's on a totally separate topic. That's okay. Fine. So I have a, a new match who's been contacting me this weekend, and uh, She's 33 centimetres more than that to my aunt. And I was saying, I'm not sure we're going to be able to figure that out, you know, Ireland and so on. But uh, she doesn't match my aunt at all, I'm dead much. Okay. How could that be? Which website is she on? We're both on Family Tree DNA. Oh, ah, not. small and segments. I'm going to give us the dollar. Yeah. Explain. Yeah, Family Tree DNA. They add up all the tiny bits mm. of DNA to get a total centimorgans. You will find, if you go and look at the chromosome browser, you yeah. only want to count segments greater than seven centimorgans. Right. You'll yeah. probably find her aunt in there. Yeah, so she won't show as a match on another site that do all that before they um, give you the match list. That's really useful, thanks. It raises another important question or an important point is that we're, we've been talking about how we help adoptees. But of course, adoptees can go out and do the whole thing themselves. And there's probably a lot more adoptees that are trying to do it themselves mm -hmm. than are getting in touch with you know, really good genetic genealogists who can give them a helping hand. So in, in that sense, it's you know, the, the situation is running away from ourselves even more. Um, so I'm just wondering, uh, in the, in, what would you like to see in the best case scenario in terms of... Um, uh, social services. What kind of support would you like to see for social services? Um, I just think it doesn't have to be either or, and I think probably going forward, the ideal is because isn't it wonderful that science now allows you know that uncertainty to be removed, and so that's that's a real gift. But I think. Um, it's like any, you know, anything that involves relationships, people, we need to be mindful of the impact. And um, we've touched on that a lot today. Um, I think there's a real opportunity here um, going forward um, to actually build, to collaborate, and to actually in ways that would have been unheard of. I mean, it was wonderful to hear Julia's story and to think the outcome, you know, it's please don't think for one minute that um, I see this other than something really um, exciting, something that um, certainly from a social work point of view, um, it's lovely to be able to have confirmation and it's an additional tool. But I, I do think the danger, I see it sometimes when people have gone off on their own account They've made a mess of things and then they approach an agency to see if we can patch things up. And inevitably that's really difficult. Um, so it's kind of getting from an education um, to get the message out there that look, nobody's trying to police this, we're trying to assist. Um, and you know, you can do that from a genealogical perspective and also from a social work perspective, from a counselling 
perspective and you know let's collaborate on this and get people the scaffolding that they need to help them going forward do, do yes yeah, sure please add a comment right, um, this is just from the point of view generally in a bit of advertising for the organization i work for it's adopt ni and we support uh, adults who are involved in the adoption triangle we offer support groups counseling and one-to-one -one, uh, support so if anybody's interested in that you can find us <coughs> online adopt <coughs> ni great um, sorry, Adopt NI. Adopt NI. Now, do you have um, support groups? And is there a capacity for genetic genealogists to come and maybe talk to a support group or something like that? Or I actually um, I spoke with Martin McDowell um, earlier um, because I would um, be involved in terms of training for post adoption workers. And we would meet on a twice a year, and I've already spoken to Martin with the view if he would come along and speak to social workers in the field. So um, we absolutely. So I did that before I came in here today to see if we could work together. Well, I'm glad that you're in safe hands. <laughs> you're definitely in safe hands with Martin. Um, and um, we actually met with social workers in Dublin as well. Because they had a training day and we talked to them about genetic genealogy and we talked, took them through the process as well. So they are aware of what it can do and occasionally now I get referrals from outside of Tusla and Bernardo's because it was all of the different adoption agencies in Ireland as well. Um, I've got another question about the contact preference register um, and then we'll come to you Jill. Um, there is a contact preference register in the south. But in the north, are the records closed up here in the north? Adoption records are closed. Um, adopted adults, um, so if you were born before December of 1987, under our legislation, you're obliged to have a counselling um, session with a social worker um, ahead of getting your, your details. And you can then access your information. Um, people born after December of 87, they can actually access their birth cert without the need to have any involvement from social services. What I would say to people is, though, if you will um, approach the likes of um, the post-adoption team in Belfast or Adopt MI, we can actually then access what records are held so that going forward, you're going forward with the information in terms of what was the story at the time. You can bring that information up to date with research ahead of, and then use an intermediary to make an approach. So that would be certainly what I think would be best practice. Um, and obviously the DNA, the internet, all links, it all has a, a role to play these days. But I think the danger is that sometimes people go off and you know, they're on a mission, and you'll have met that, and you know, they're blind to anyone else's needs except their own, unfortunately. Absolutely. Um, the other thing, of course, is that if you can access your records, you were born after 1987, your parents probably had a Facebook account, yeah, yes. and there's nothing to stop anybody, forget about DNA, just coming to get their birth certificate and... A little bit of genealogy, and you can find the marriage record, and you know you might even be able to trace them down. But you probably come across that as well. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think the sad thing is that the thinking behind the legislation and the need to have a counselling session was because essentially, let's face it, what happened quite rightly in my view with the 1987 legislation here was that we moved the goalposts for generations of birth mothers. You know, there's literally hundreds of birth mothers out there in Ireland who were assured that once they signed consent to the adoption, that would be the end of the matter. Now, the, we recognise through um, research um, that obviously identity is closely linked with the knowledge of one's past. And, you know, I don't need to tell anybody in this room about the significance of the past. So we get that now in a way that we maybe didn't when the legislation was passed. But nonetheless, we do need to be very sensitive to 
the impact because birth mothers were told to go ahead, not to tell anybody, you know, the whole shame around, um, you know, conception outside of marriage. Um, and, you know, we're now 2020, but can I say to you, many, many, many of the birth parents, primarily birth mothers, but I've also worked with birth fathers, they're still locked in the era when the child was conceived. And the shame that they were made to feel is still palpable. You know, so um, please, please be sensitive to that in all of your considerations. And of course, you never know the circumstances of the conception because there could have been violence involved and, you know, you could be walking into a quagmire. You know, you never know when you're going to put your foot in it. Jill, you had a comment? Um, I, was, I work as a, on a voluntary basis as a searcher for Birthlink, the charity in Scotland um, that puts people in touch, um, adoptees and that. And I was just going to say that even if people identify people through DNA, it's still possible to go back to Birthlink and have that connection and the contact made and get the support. So it is important to remember that, that even if we're helping people to identify who the end person is, that it doesn't need to be dashed into, and it is often better to have an intermediary, not drop the nuclear bomb in somebody else's family. Um, we have a comment here. I'm going to come around the other side. C'est comment et en français, oui? No. Uh, I will try in English. Uh, I, I will do my best. Please forgive me. Um, well, I wanted to talk about a specificity in France uh, with a statistic which could be interesting. Uh, in France, we, we have a specific case which is unknown mother, which means that a mother can give birth to her baby and decided to give absolutely no information. It's totally anonymous. Nesuzix, that's a word. Uh, I, sh I think it could be some kind of John Doe birth. John Doe birth. Right. Well, it's very particular in France. Uh, at, the, at the beginning, it was meant to, um, to try to not have a mother killing that baby. It was to say, you can give birth anonymously, totally anonymous, then don't kill your baby. You are protected. But that's why it was made. Then uh, we have to remind that the uh, European Union has a law, origin, uh, the right to the origins, which means that Everyone, everyone has the right to know his origins. It's international law. You have the right to know. That doesn't mean that you have, you have the right to know the person. You have the right to know your history. That's not the same thing. Then the French government has no ever other choice to make a, with the Ministry of Health a specific uh, establishment Conseil National d'Accès aux Origines Personnelles, to help the adoptee to find their birth parents. And there was the case of the John Doe babies. Then, as they, they have statistics about 10 years of being doing so, about 10 years, then for the John Doe babies, they try to find the mother. When the, the adults come and say, I want to know. Now I want to know, for half of the demons, the agency could do nothing because the records were empty or destroyed. For half of the records. For the other half of the records, they have enough information to contact the mother. And they contact the mother and they ask them, you decided to give birth totally Anonymous, 20, 30, 40 years ago, now it's an adult who wants to meet you. What do you decide? Half of the mother did agree 
تو میزی هدف That's all. That's very interesting. Does that figure surprise people that half of these mothers who gave birth to Jane Doe babies or John Doe babies completely anonymously, half of them later wanted, well, in fact, was of those that we could identify, which was half of the total, half of them did want to actually have contact with their adult child. Does that surprise anyone? No? No? It's strange. It, it has implications, of course, as well, because if half of the mothers are interested in contacting, being contacted by their children, that will probably encourage the children to take DNA tests in France, where it's always a little bit difficult to do DNA testing, um, and to uh, try and find their biological parents that way. And of course, only the mothers were asked. Were the fathers asked, would they be interested in having contact with this Jane Doe baby? Uh, I think we uh, there, there could be a subject about psychology of papa, because I have met a lot of adoptives to talk about, because I plan to help them, of course, um, but with a deontological, uh, how to say, a way of being, with psychologists and so on, it's very, uh, we understand that it's very sensible, sensitive. Uh, but in fact, when I have adoptives, uh, I say, well, you have found your mother and your father. Does, that, does it interest you? And in fact, not so much. They are, it's really the link with the mother who, who is important and the link to say she has given giving birth to me and she has not rejected me, but she has uh, given me away. And this, this is very crucial for them. It's a mother. It is uh, probably a common theme is that adoptees are more interested in finding out who they find. Or it is, yep. They're more interested in finding out who their mother was than who their father was. And I think that's probably quite common that they go initially for the finding of the birth mother. And then you might mention, well, are you interested in finding your birth father? And it's like an afterthought. Well, sure, if you can find him. You know. <laughs> but it is very much an afterthought. Um, well, we're coming towards the end, but we'll have time for another couple of comments. I was just going to comment, we've been talking a lot about the, um, the mothers and the children, but we haven't uh, mentioned anything about the wider extended family, and there's a whole vast network involved, and quite often when these family secrets are covered up, you end up with some members of the family knowing, others not knowing, and then you've got this whole nightmare of you know, which other family members to contact, do they know, do they not know, um, and I don't quite know what the answer is for dealing with these extended family networks. And I know that um, with the NP Gateway, they have even have special groups set up for, you know, say if you're the, the partner of an adoptee, um, because it really <coughs> impacts on, on you, because you've got this partner who's now suddenly dealing with this big emotional experience, and there's no support network for any of these other members of the extended family. So I don't know what people think about that and what the answer is. I think that's a very good point, and, and certainly um, when I've dealt with families and the news gets out, then there frequently is this large debate, which can be very um, stressful for people, is, you know, and the more distant cousins think the adoptee has the right to know, and of course the immediate family is, well, we've got to protect mum. Uh, so there really is that conflict, and that conflict can spill over into the extended family, especially if you're approaching the adoptee via a second cousin, and then a first cousin, and then the next step is, well, you know, suddenly somebody's half-sibling <coughs> turns up in, the, in your, their list of matches, and what do you do then? And that happened to one of my uh, adoptees. She wasn't sure how to approach her father, who was identified by her biological parents. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know what that was. Uh, I'll move away down here, though, just to be on the same side. An alien UFO man. We're all going to be adopted. Um, but then the, uh, the biological father's, um, uh, biological father's sister appeared among her matches and immediately got in touch with her. 
So the cat was out of the bag. And I think on that note, before we're abducted, we probably should go over today. But thank you all very much for your um, for the wonderful discussion we've had. I think it's very, very productive and it's very, very useful to share these these um, thoughts and discussions. And of course, let's not forget uh, the wonderful presentation that started this all off from Cahill McIlwain. There are at least two people in the room related to Julia. One of them is me. <laughs> well, thank you all very much for attending. Um, thank you for uh, uh, contributing over the last two days. Thank you to Family Tree DNA for a wonderful um, conference. Thank you to all the ISOG volunteers for um, helping to organize this. And hopefully we'll see you all again next year. So safe travels. See you back in Belfast in 2021. My pleasure.